Welcome to Tourism Talk. I'm Laura Oswald, Director of Marketing at the Paducah Convention and Visitors Bureau. Today, we're on location at the Lloyd Tillman House and Civil War Museum to go behind the experience of Paducah's untold Civil War story. Join us. Thanks so much to Bill Baxter for welcoming us into the museum today. It's great to have you on Tourism Talk. Well, it's a distinct, distinct pleasure for us to be uh, able to, uh, to, uh, to spread the word a little of the, about the, the Tillman Museum. And why do we say the Tillman Museum? Actually, the Lloyd Tillman House mm -hmm. and Civil War Museum. But the house is named uh, the Tillman House because Lloyd Tillman and his wife Augusta and their six children were the first occupants of the home. The home had been built by a Mr. and Mrs. Robert Woolfolk, uh, who were, had been longtime residents of Paducah. And they, I think they had aspirations of moving into their, this nice new four bedroom home. But along comes this Tillman family. Well, who was Lloyd Tillman in 1852 that he could just move you mm -hmm. right out of your, your brand new home? Sounds a little uh, nefarious, but it was not. Lloyd Tillman had just been hired by the city of Paducah. Uh, to bring the first rail line into this city. Mm -hmm. The city was already a flourishing port right here on the Tennessee and, and Ohio rivers, but they needed a way to distribute these goods out into the, uh, to the country. And uh, Lloyd Tillman had been working down in Jackson, Tennessee um, for another railroading mm -hmm. firm. The city of Paducah heard of uh, this fellow being down there. His reputation preceded him because he had been involved in the Isthmus of Panama railroading project uh, in 1849, um, a very, very uh, contentious um, and, and difficult task. But he, his uh, reputation as a rail builder preceded him. The city of Paducah heard that he was in the area, and they hired him away from the New Orleans and Jackson Railroad at the time. And that's such a good opportunity to make the connection between Paducah's various elements of our heritage, so river to rail, and then that leads into our Civil War heritage. And so we love that the experience here at the museum has brought that to light in a new way and making those connections. Yes, and uh, it's been a really a, a discovery, uh, a learning discovery for me over the years. Um, I came here uh, 20 years ago this year uh, to be near my mother-in-law. But uh, I was fortunate to, to get involved with the museum. And almost immediately, uh, the museum uh, became uh, a passion. Yeah. Uh, there were so many great things. We have wonderful donors and oftentimes long-term loaners of wonderful Civil War period mm -hmm. artifacts and, uh, and material. Um, but what really started coming out were the stories yes, that had not been about. told. And uh, um, I shouldn't probably do this, but I would uh, like to just bring up what I considered the real enlightener for mm -hmm. me. And, and that was a, a book that this literally came out of a yard sale here in town. The book, yeah, but it was a book entitled Center of Conflict. And it had been written by a Mr. Hall Allen, who was then the editor publisher for what was known as the Paducah Sun Democrat. He wrote this book, Center of Conflict, about the history of the Civil War in Paducah and Western Kentucky in 1961 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Civil War. When I opened the pages of this book and started reading about the great history that I, I had not heard before, it just, uh, it just opened up um, many, many doors. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, he would mention people that I'd never heard of in, in my readings or visitations to other, other uh, Civil War uh, areas. And all of a sudden, all of these stories just started coming out of the pages of the books, and it would lead me to inquire and, and research. And uh, I'm just uh, absolutely amazed every day that I come to work here how much history transpired in this small town right. in Paducah, Kentucky. 
And I think it all does come back to those stories and the power of stories. We've been celebrating the year of Kentucky storytellers, mm -hmm. and that is an ode to the importance mm -hmm. of sharing stories and mm -hmm. these personal and authentic connections to place here in Kentucky. Yes. What do you see, you know, why does it matter that we share those untold stories with visitors, locals or visitors? Well, it just, it just really brings to light how small this country was during the Civil War. We, we've grown immensely, but uh, when you start reading about each and every one of these individuals that you pull from the books mm -hmm. that have been written, such as uh, a lady by the name of Anna Ella Carroll, who I've been, been uh, speaking to various civic groups about recently. Uh, she's an exciting young woman um, who in the 19th century uh, was acting as almost as a spy for Abraham Lincoln. But she comes through Paducah and then on her way up to St. Louis, uh, she delivers a message back to the president uh, that, she, uh, uh, that will forever change that Civil War history. It puts Paducah on the map, and, and to, so to speak. It brings a fellow by the name of Ulysses S. Grant. Mm -hmm. And then other people such as William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, the, the names that most of us are, uh, if we've read anything of the Civil War over the years, we know the big names. But there are so many other names that start popping out. Uh, Charles Ferguson Smith, uh, he was known as the teacher of Civil War generals. He had been the commandant of cadets uh, at West Point, the U.S. Military Academy. When the likes of Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman and many other famous uh, names of the Civil War uh, come to light. But he had been their teacher. And now he finds himself in Paducah, Kentucky, subordinate to the very students that he taught all of the military prowess. It's a, it's a wonderful story. That's just one of many. Um, and you mentioned that the Paducah story is perhaps a different Civil War story, um, a different perspective than you might hear at a very far southern or far northern um, Civil War attraction. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, how does that differ here? Well, uh, many of the books that were written, for, I would say a good hundred years following the Civil War, um, tended to, uh, to be about the Eastern Theater of Operations, and we call this the Western Theater of Operations of the Civil War. But that was because that's where the media centers were. All the large newspapers were in the large cities along the East Coast. And so a lot of uh, the Civil War history that had been written um, for many years took place from Gettysburg to Appomattox and possibly down into Georgia. But what happens here is, is now Paducah is on the map because of a fellow by the name of Ulysses S. Grant, who defies a direct order from his commander up in St. Louis by the name of, of uh, Henry Halleck. And he, he defies his order to remain in Cairo, but on the 5th of September of 1861, he puts 5,000 Union troops on a boat to come to Paducah and occupy the city. Now he's He's doing that because he knows there's another gentleman in the area, another one of those names that, that not many people are familiar with but has a profound impact on, on this Civil War. But he happens to be on the Confederate side. Mm -hmm. and this is a General Leonidas Polk. He's known as the Fighting Bishop. When the war broke out, he was the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in the state of Louisiana. Now, in a prior life, I like to say, he was a young cadet, and he graduated from West Point, the U.S. Military Academy. Spent a few years in the, in the Army. And then he said, no, I have this calling to the pulpit. So he resigns his commission as an Army officer and, and gets into the priesthood of the, the Episcopal Church, rises to that prominent position of bishop. Well, what's the connection here? When the war breaks out, he writes his old best friend, from his West Point days, who happened to be a fellow by the name of Jefferson Davis. Dear Mr. President, of course, being the president of the Confederacy, how can I best serve you in this dire time? And Jeff Davis writes him back in no uncertain terms. He says, basically, I would like for you to remove your, your bishop's robes and put on a decent uniform again. And Leonidas Polk, 
He said, I need, uh, Jefferson Davis basically says, I need your mil military leadership at this juncture much more than your spiritual guidance. Leonidas Polk would remove his bishop robes and put on a Confederate general's uniform. And then he brings 12,000 Louisiana troops to a place we all know as Columbus, Belmont, mm -hmm. or Columbus, Kentucky, on the Mississippi River, mm -hmm. 45 miles from Paducah. Ulysses S. Grant realizes that General Polk may be about to move on Paducah, and so he brings his troops here first, and as a result of that, that, that defying a direct order from his, his commander in St. Louis, and, and wanting to get here before the fighting bishop, Polk, um, Grant comes here and the Union will occupy Paducah for the duration of the war. And really making their way to the rivers, we're talking about the Mississippi River there mm -hmm. along Columbus, mm -hmm. Belmont, yes. and here in Paducah, the confluence mm -hmm. of the Ohio and Tennessee. Mm -hmm. How does that, um, as we're talking about all these connections to these people mm -hmm. and notable figures, the rivers were a con connector and an important. The rivers piece were of that. everything. Everything were everything. The issue was that this Leonidas Polk that we just talked about had ensconced himself there in Columbus, placed sixty cannon along the cliff sides. So all of a sudden, all of the Union shipping of agricultural goods from those northern states of Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa mm -hmm. came to a screeching halt because. A large chain had been strung across the river at Columbus and stopping the flow of all those agricultural goods. Lincoln knew it was going to be a bloody battle to fight his way direct, have his army fight directly down the Mississippi River. And that's where this, that young lady of Anna Ella Carroll, who came on a, an emissarial visit and report back to Abraham Lincoln himself, she carries that message back that you don't have to go down the Mississippi, if you come to Paducah, that gives you access to the Cumberland yes. and Tennessee rivers, which parallel the Mississippi. The Mississippi will eventually fall. Wow. And she was absolutely correct. We always talk about Paducah being at the hub of the inland waterways, and there's mm -hmm. no better example than during this time in history and how Paducah played such an important role. Exactly, and that Paducah being at the apex of these four mm -hmm. rivers, uh, really did uh, yes. bring bring home the importance. The rivers were everything. We didn't have interstate paved roads mm -hmm. uh, in 1861. As, as we all know, when it rains in, in western Kentucky, it gets muddy. Your army goes nowhere mm -hmm. for weeks if, that, if, if, if it rains. And those rivers, though, however, have always been there. They've flowed for eons. This is before the 1930s and the TVA dams that, that went in and changed the rivers mm -hmm. here. These were free-flowing rivers. They were the interstate highways of 1861. And Grant and Lincoln and the Union Army knew that they could use these rivers to transport their army deep into the heart of the South. Yeah. It's considered by modern historians and, and military uh, tacticians to, to be probably one of the most egregious errors that the Confederacy mm -hmm. makes early in the war. It spells no doom. They can never recover once they gave up control of these riverways. So I hope that our viewers are seeing that you truly have made this a passion and you have a wealth of knowledge, and that is where this experience is so valuable, I think, in that you are using the experience to connect the public to these stories. Well, our motto here, our goal, mm -hmm. is that we want to preserve, interpret, and then share mm -hmm. the information that we are, um, that's coming forth with. It's just like it's just, there are stories that are just screaming to be told. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, 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 because there are so many people and so many incidents uh, that took place right here in Paducah, which have, have such a pro, mm -hmm. uh, profound impact on the outcome of that Civil War. Yes. So visitors, you know, locals or visitors alike can come in here on a daily basis and experience many of these stories, these artifacts. Um, but for a group, I think that that really does enhance the experience through the Paducah Signature Experience. What is the ideal group size to 
to bring into the Tillman house. Well, I've had probably as many as 60 or 70 in here, but that, mm -hmm. that is uh, when we have, have the, uh, uh, the paddle boat tours mm -hmm. come in and they're dropping people off and picking them up. Mm -hmm. that, that's not a good gauge. Um, normally, I can, I can handle a 25 to 30 mm -hmm. person uh, group. Uh, to come in, uh, we're as you as you can see, we're, uh, or we'll see. Uh, the, the rooms can be small, uh, but we we manage to, to maneuver yeah. around and, and and bring bring those stories and, and the experience to to all of our visitors. And twenty five to thirty is a group is a good sized group. I think of many mm -hmm. local groups that this could apply yes. to. You know, mm -hmm. I know you've had some church groups in here or historically focused We've groups. had church groups, we've had flower cl uh, clubs, mm -hmm. we've had the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, yes. um, Kiwanis Club, Lions mm -hmm. Club. Uh, we, yes, we, 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 we try to uh, expose ourselves to, to as many. Yes. Um, the, the stories are just there waiting to be told. Well, we certainly want to encourage our viewers to head to paducah.travel slash groups, our website, and see the listing of all of the experiences, um, including the Civil War Museum. Um, what, you know, connecting with those other experiences, this is a great um, flip-flop tour pairing with the Hotel Metropolitan or another local experience. How do you feel that a visitor or even a local experiencing multiple museums within the same kind of time frame, how can that benefit? Well, uh, it, it's that we, as you say, we can bring them all together with the Metropolitan and the African-American experiences, mm -hmm. with our Railroad Museum. Mm -hmm. Who is the man who brought the railroads right. here? Lloyd Tillman. He starts this hundred years of in which railroading will be the primary source of jobs and income mm -hmm. in this region, and uh, it just it allowed Paducah to survive after the Civil War mm -hmm. and carried it right on up past World War II, yes. in which the uh, the atomic energy uh, plant. Uh, out west of town, then took over as the leading economic mm -hmm. driver for many years in the city. But but it was railroading, and so there's a, there's that tie, and it's uh, um, we do have have uh, experiences. Uh, the form one of the, the earliest African American units to be formed yes. to fight for the Union Army came from former slaves right here in Paducah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Miss Betty Dobson uh, talks about that in her museum mm -hmm. uh, the, and gives, gives great honor and, and reverence to the 8th U.S. Heavy Artillery Colored Unit. And we, we talk about the participation of the African-American soldiers on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, there were uh, many people uh, I've learned over the years and, and many people have pointed uh, it out to me, but um, over 200,000 African-Americans are listed on the rolls of the Confederate Army. Now, what comes into contention there is to what was their real role? And it, as it turns out, the Confederacy could never quite bring themselves to arming the African-American mm -hmm. soldier in any large numbers. They, there was always the fear that, yes, they would turn on them. Um, so, uh, but the, the, there were as many as 200,000. But we, we tried to talk about what the relationship was mm -hmm. there. And, and, um, Ulysses S. Grant said when, they, when the Union uh, started to uh, draft and train African Americans into the Union Army, he said this is probably the most serious blow given mm -hmm. yet to the Confederacy. Uh, and yet uh, the Confederacy could never bring themselves to, to arming their own African Americans mm -hmm. uh, in any large numbers. And their depleted um, army uh, at the, toward the end of war, could could have much used that, mm -hmm. but uh, it would, was not to not to be. We try to place these in the proper context and, yes. and perspectives. And I think that you know they always say you have to know your history so that the the bad doesn't yes. repeat itself, and that we can mm -hmm. learn from um, where we have been. And yes. so I think that that is mm -hmm. what is so great about this building, and for locals mm -hmm. who have not been into mm -hmm. the Tillman House yet, I think it's so worth well, a visit. It is, and there, there, there is a perception at times that, well, this is the former home of a Confederate general. And once you come through the front doors, you're probably going to see uh, several examples of uh, Confederate standards and banners that would have, uh, that would have flown during the war. Um, I am known as the token Yankee in the house. Uh, I was born in, uh, in Missouri, but raised in Kansas and came here to be near my mother-in-law. But uh, I, we, have, we have a good natured teasing about me being north of that Ohio River. But it is this old Yankee, this northerner, who uh, 
who decided about 15 years ago, I didn't know anything about all of the Confederate mm -hmm. banners and the official flags of the Confederacy and other symbols. And so when you see these, don't it, a lot of people will walk in and they'll say, oh, we just stumbled into a Confederate memorial. And yes, it is, as I said, in the home of a man who becomes a Confederate general. Mm -hmm. But that's not why these flags are there. They're there so that we can talk about them and put these symbols in, in the, into the proper perspective. And that, you know, in talking about the experience, experience is such a, a buzzword in the travel industry right now. And I think that it really is that because of what you're talking about, the mm -hmm. education and the context and the things that you can't get just by looking at something online. You have to be here and to see and get the understanding from an expert um, of how all of this fits together and what we truly can learn from this and, and take away from the Paducah's untold Civil War story. Well, and that's, that's exactly what we hope to do is to have people leave and, and having experienced and then learning mm -hmm. uh, from this, uh, from coming. And another way that people can learn, aside from the experience, um, is through the U.S. Grant Trail. Um, the yes. Tillman House is part of that trail. It's a regional trail. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit well, more Mr. about Greg that. Mr. Greg Walk. Um, yes. He's a, um, a gentleman from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. I uh, had put together a wonderful travel guide mm -hmm. from, uh, for all of the Civil War historic sites uh, in uh, and throughout Missouri. Mm -hmm. And... He got to thinking, well, you know, this is very significant uh, that uh, St. Louis uh, resident, Ulysses S. Grant, um, be, you know, he becomes the president of the United States because of his war, uh, because of his war participation. But um, Mr. Walk approached us um, two or three years ago now uh, with, the, with the idea of forming this national trail of, that Ulysses S. Grant followed in his rise to fame and fortune. And of course, it all begins in St. Louis, moves to Cairo, and it comes to Paducah. And this is, I have always considered to be Ulysses S. Grant's springboard mm -hmm. to, to uh, fame and, and, and right. glory. Um, he, had, uh, he just uses this to uh, stage his battles at Fort Donaldson, and Henry, then further down to Shiloh and Vicksburg, back to Chattanooga, mm -hmm. but it all begins right here in Paducah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Walt was, was so gracious in, in mm -hmm. allowing us uh, to share in that experience. And uh, yes. uh, so there, it gives us a little bit of national notoriety. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it does connect us to various other oh, important sites. It's such most, a great tour most, for those that are very interested. Uh, I often tell people if they say we're going, getting ready to go on a, on a Civil War tour of the mm -hmm. southern battle sites, I say, well, you have started at the right place because yes. this is where it all begins. Right. And once we show them uh, what actually has transpired from Grant having occupied Paducah, in that in that uh, fall of 1861, it's just amazing. There, there's a, well, another wonderful book, and I always refer back to mm -hmm. my my reading. But uh, Kendall Gott, who teaches current day command and tactics mm -hmm. at the Army's General Command and Staff College, he wrote a book in uh, 2012 in commemoration of the sesquicentennial mm -hmm. of the Civil War, and it was called "Where the South Lost the War," and we're talking right. Yeah. Wow. And then you know when when you when you apprise uh, visitors mm -hmm. uh, of of the fact that this the importance of these rivers mm -hmm. and of of owning Paducah mm -hmm. for the entire full world again it's considered one of the major major mistakes that was yes. made early on that just doomed the Confederacy. Well, I think we, I hope mm -hmm. that our viewers will see mm -hmm. um, and be be inspired to come visit the museum. Perhaps schedule a group experience or come in um, and just schedule a personal tour. Mm -hmm. You give a great tour. Mm -hmm. You give so much time and passion to any mm -hmm. any size group that you have. And I have to mention your sidekick um, ah. Baxter, yeah, who please. is you. You mentioned he's a TripAdvisor sensation now. Ah, well, it's my understanding, and. You know, uh, Yes, the family came in and they wrote their, their little uh, resume of, of, or their, uh, of, of what they saw, thought of the visit. And they said, it was a wonderful little museum, but you're going to love the dog. Yes. And they took pictures and there he was. He, he went viral on, on TripAdvisor. And, and, uh, and we but, love uh, he's a, he's a, he's, 
He's a good welcomer. Yes, he is. He is. And we love that you're using TripAdvisor to help mm -hmm. encourage people to review their experience here and mm -hmm. share um, share why others should come. And, yes. and, and that is such a powerful mm -hmm. example of storytelling and word of mouth mm -hmm. and creating those ambassadors through experience as well. Well, we, we hope to, to include as many as we, we possibly can and, yes. and, and allow them to come and, and, and share in the experience. Awesome. Well, is there anything else that you would like to leave our viewers with? Um, maybe just a last word of why they should come visit if they've not? Well, we, we of course, focus on, on the history and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the, all the great people who, wa who walked the streets of, of, of the city. But uh, in just recent, uh, a recent amount of time, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking two years ago, we did not even allow people into the upstairs mm -hmm. area yes. of the home. and. Through the good fortune and just uh, by word of mouth, there were people who heard that, that uh, we may be in search of, of some wonderful period pieces of mm -hmm. furniture. And the generosity uh, of this community has just been overwhelming. And in the last two years, we've kind of gone from rags to riches, I say, upstairs. We've opened it up. We have four mm -hmm. completely furnished uh, period uh, Civil War period uh, rooms, uh, and then uh, exciting uh, addition was was a, an 1840 loom yes. uh, that w that was brought into the to the museum. It came in in 124 pieces, and I thought, what is this? Well, thank goodness we we're, we're fortunate to have first of all uh, the National Quilt Museum, mm -hmm. which has just been an, an absolutely marvelous uh, resource uh, to. To learn of, of certain things, but then there's another young lady just down the street who does vintage weaving, and she was called in, and she looked at a pile of 124 pieces of wood and said, "We've got ourselves a wonderful old loom." And it is incredible. And she assisted uh, in putting that together and, and educating us on mm -hmm. on what this loom was really all about, and then the the fact that. That thing was obsolete in 1840, right. and how it and how uh, the fabric industry was revolutionized, and, and just but with wonderful pieces that we'd love love to share yes. with all our visitors, and we're able to do now. Well, thank you so much, Bill, Bill, for inviting us in, and from the loom to the river artifacts to the notable um, notable people in the Civil War. We, there's so many stories to share here. So thank you for being well, with us. We look forward to, to uh, greeting each and every one of you. And Baxter will, will be, uh, uh, he'll be up and, and greeting Wonderful. when you come to see us. Wonderful. And thank you for joining us today on Tourism Talk. Visit paducah.travel slash groups to learn more about this and all the Paducah Signature experiences. One, two. One, two, go. Hello. <laughs>